Hello, everybody. I'm Danny Russell. I'm vice president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thanks for joining this program, which is organized by my colleagues in the Center on U.S.-China Relations. And uh, today we're graced uh, by the presence of uh, Professor David Shambaugh. Uh, he's the author of uh, an important new book, Where Great Powers Meet, America and China in Southeast Asia. Uh, David is the Gaston Segur Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs. And wait, there's more. The founding director of the China Policy Program in the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. David, you need a, either a shorter title or an acronym. Yeah. So David is uh, the author or the editor of an absolutely intimidating number of books on China. Uh, what's even more galling than his incredible prolific productivity is the, is the pace of his publishing these books seems to be accelerating. Mm -hmm. So I think he's... Uh, kind of closing in on, I don't know, three books in two years or four books in three years. Anyway, uh, you're making the rest of us look like slackers. Uh, but um, we're going to ask David to, uh, to explain uh, some of the background and the content of his book, and we'll have a conversation. We'll make time for questions towards the end. Uh, I will be finished uh, at the end of the hour. David, um, most, most of my own career has been in Northeast Asia. Uh, and in fact, your namesake or position's namesake, Gaston Seeger, was the uh, National Security uh, Council's senior director for Asia. When I first became a diplomat and was stationed in Tokyo, where Gaston used to visit often, uh, mm -hmm. and when I then, 25 years or so later, uh, had his job uh, in the first Obama term, um, the importance of Southeast Asia to the U.S. Uh, and to U.S. long-term interests was something that was profoundly clear to us. Um, and the, the contributing factors in our policy thinking were the very things that you wrote about uh, in, in this great book, you know, the region's economic dynamism, it's useful, dem youthful demographics, uh, the stability that ASEAN's brought to a region with pretty amazing diversity and, uh, and a history of, of conflicts within the region. And of course, uh, Southeast Asia also struck us, as it did you, as a major arena where American interests and Chinese interests very directly intersect. Um, and I guess having a president who'd spent much of his childhood in Indonesia than her either. So Southeast Asia was a, was a big part of the rebalance to Asia. Uh, the decision for the United States to sign the, the ASEAN Treaty, the TAC, and to join the East Asia Summit, um, which was Obama's decision, um, that was meant uh, as a significant long-term commitment to ASEAN centrality to regional architecture, um, commitment to the people and the governments in the region. So, you know, one of the things that makes your book uh, so timely, in my view, is that the incoming Biden administration, uh, which is ramping up right now, is certain to include a significant number of people, including Biden himself, who share that commitment. Uh, it's also timely, of course, because of the many, you know, shifting currents uh, in Southeast Asia, the impact of COVID-19, the recent conclusion of the uh, RCEP uh, trade agreement, increased competition over water in the Mekong, over fish in the South China Sea, the list goes on. So speaking of timely, uh, it's time for me to stop talking and let you uh, explain to us uh, some of the background and some of the substance of your book. And when you are done, we can chat for a little while and open the floor to questions. In the meantime, uh, viewers can submit their questions uh, by 
using the text function in YouTube or in Facebook, and uh, we'll, we'll collect them and try to get to as many of them as we can in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So, David, over to you. Right. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, hosting uh, today's session uh, personally, uh, but also the Asia, uh, the Policy Institute of the Asia Society and the Center for U.S.-China Relations and, and in absentia, uh, my good friend and colleague Orville Schell. Um, I'm really very grateful uh, to have the opportunity to present this book um, uh, at, for the Asia Society, really worldwide. This is streaming, I gather, to all the different centers um, around the world. Um, there's probably no more appropriate institution, in fact, in which to launch uh, such a book. So I'm really delighted. Thanks very much to the Asia Society and to you, Danny, for uh, uh, for this opportunity. And I must say, just thank you too, I'll get to this in the presentation, but thank you too for all your contributions uh, to US relations with Southeast Asia. Uh, during the Obama period and before. Um, uh, one of the uh, findings of my book is that uh, U.S. relations with Southeast Asia were never better than during those eight years during the Obama administration. And I don't want to anticipate uh, some of my conclusions I'm going to talk more about, but this was the exception to the rule, I would say, the Obama period. The rule, unfortunately, for American diplomacy in the region has been episodic. Um, some people call it benign neglect, uh, but there was some constancy and some um, serious resources uh, and attention paid uh, consistently over those um, those eight years from the president on down, as, as you indicate, he spent six years of his youth in, in Indonesia. He himself visited every country in Southeast Asia except Brunei, um, which was scheduled but postponed, although the Sultan of Brunei then did come to the White House. Um, so that eight, and many initiatives that I, we can get into in discussion today, including Waisili, the Young Southeast Asia Leader Initiative, which is still ongoing. Um, but many initiatives were undertaken during the Obama administration and U.S. relations with the region that are commendable. And you yourself, um, the reason I raise this because you yourself had a major hand and role to play in it. And Gaston Seeger, we can talk about subsequently, but I have to also thank Gaston Seeger for launching me into Asian studies and into my career. He was my undergraduate professor at George Washington. Um, and <laughs> arranged after graduation for an internship for me in the State Department in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, uh, in which I first worked in the China Division, and then they moved me to the Southeast Asia Division. And that led, in fact, to an opportunity to go work in the National Security Council in the White House for Michael Oxenberg and Michael Armacost. So Seeger had a direct impact on my own education in the classroom, uh, and then subsequently through these internship opportunities. So I, it's, I now hold the chair in his memory at our university, but like many people, they don't know the person whose chair they hold. I actually knew Gaston very well, and I had great, great admiration for him. So um, let me just, what I'd like to do in, in the time um, to begin, I want to have a lot, much time for conversation between the two of us and for uh, question and answer uh, dialogue with our audience, our viewers really around the world. <clears throat> but let me try and uh, do three things um, just to kind of catalyze uh, that conversation. Uh, first, um, uh, to provide a kind of general overview of the book hopefully maybe to incentivize you to go, those of us who are, those of you who are watching, go out and order a copy. Um, Christmas is coming, you know, um, might make a great stocking stuffer, a gift for your loved ones. No, in all seriousness. Um, so let me uh, give some preliminary uh, context to why I undertook this project. Then let me offer um, a couple of the major conclusions and takeaways uh, from the book, and then wind up uh, peering into the future with a few possible scenarios for where uh, the U.S.-China relationship in and with Southeast Asia uh, may go. So that's a little bit of a roadmap, three things I'd like to open up with, and then we can have our conversation. So a little background. Um, this, this is both an extension of my previous 
career long work really on Chinese foreign relations with different parts of the world. But it's also very, was very new terrain. You might say terra incognita for me, surprisingly. I had never worked uh, analytically on China's relations with Southeast Asia in any depth. And I'd never really surprisingly spent that much time in the region in Southeast Asia. I'd been to Singapore numerous times. I'd been to Vietnam a couple of times and several decades ago. Uh, to Thailand and, and Burma, but I um, had not really uh, spent much time in Southeast Asia and certainly didn't understand Southeast Asia. So when I had a sabbatical, um, which is probably one of the best things about being an academic, every seven years we get sabbaticals, um, instead of going back to China, where I'd spent my previous sabbatical, in fact, um, in 2009 and 10, um, I was very fortunate to get an invitation from the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore, um, which I cannot say enough good things about. RSIS is a fabulous institution. Um, and they invited me to, to come there, um, do some teaching and, um, uh, and research. So I needed a research project. So I thought I wanted to familiarize myself with Southeast Asia. But I needed a kind of vector into the region. So I thought, OK, US-China relations, David, that's what you do. And let's try and look at the region and how the region is navigating and dealing with this increasingly. Mind you, this was four years ago. You were still in, in office. Um, uh, just <laughs> actually, I went out there just at the transition point between the Obama to the Trump period. Um, anyway, I, I thought this would be a good way to kind of um, e explore the region physically and intellectually. Um, and that was so rewarding. I can't tell you. I have now uh, um, really have become rather addicted to Southeast Asia. So it's a love affair it's, I'm going to have for the rest of my career. It's just so culturally diverse. It's diverse in all ways. And um, hence... <laughs> one cannot generalize about Southeast Asia. The first rule of thumb you learn when you go out to the region, uh, don't generalize. Second thing you learn is ASEAN doesn't really represent Southeast Asia. So don't uh, pay excessive attention to the institution of, us, of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in Jakarta, where the Secretariat is. It's an important institution, of course, but uh, everything about Southeast Asia is defined by diversity. Um, and it's very heterogeneous in, in many ways um, and very rich and very rewarding to explore. So I went all around the region. I got to every country except Laos, unfortunately. That was just circumstantial. And the Department of State actually helped facilitate that. I was on the State Department's International Speakers Program, and it was a great way to, to get around. I went, as I say, to nine of the 10 Southeast Asian countries plus India. I gave, I don't know, 40 lectures in six months or something. But that was a great way to meet um, my counterparts, my academic counterparts, students, um, journalists, and, and others. So I had a great personal education as a result of this sabbatical. And then I went back the following uh, summer uh, to finish up the field work in Malaysia and Indonesia, based again in Singapore, but at the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies this time, not at RSIS. So I had the benefit of two wonderful institutional hosts in Singapore, both of which I uh, cannot say enough good things about. So that's the kind of background, how I got into it. Um, so second sort of uh, caveat uh, to start with is uh, to note that this is not just a book about China and Southeast Asia. Um, it's very much a book about the United States and China in Southeast Asia. Um, and the, the role of the US um, runs throughout the, the book. And um, I think that sets it somewhat apart from other uh, books that are coming out. There's a wonderful uh, sort of um, miniature tsunami of publications recently. In the last eight weeks, there have been no fewer than four books on China and Southeast Asia that have been published, all really excellent um, studies. Um, but what maybe makes mine slightly different, and I commend all the other four to you, by Mike Lampton, Sebastian Strangio, Don Emerson, um, and Murray Hebert, 
Um, they're all about China and Southeast Asia. Mine is two, but I have this other dimension. And, and then the third sort of caveat is that this is not just a study of contemporary affairs. It's very much um, a book of history. <clears throat> there are two full chapters and half of two others that deal with the pre-21st century uh, relations in the region. Now, in the case of the United States, that goes back to um, 1802 when the first American consul uh, went to the Dutch East Indies in Indonesia. And then through 1833, when our first embassy was established and our first treaty signed with the Kingdom of Siam in, in Bangkok, of course. And then that chapter proceeds, um, historians, you know, <laughs> would not be happy I compressed all of this history, really 200 years worth of history into one chapter, but it proceeds through the United States becoming a Pacific and imperial, and then in the wake of the Spanish-American War, a colonial power, in the case of the Philippines, of course. Um, and then into the 20th century, the commercial expansion of the United States and the naval expansion in, in Southeast Asia. Then it goes through the Second World War, uh, the Pacific War, both in uh, maritime and mainland Southeast Asia, and finally through the Cold War, which of course includes the Vietnam, America's Vietnam War. So there's that there's kind of um, bookend chapters, you might say, at the beginning of the book, one on the U.S. and one on China. In the case of China, it goes back to the Qin Dynasty, right? 221 to 206 BC, when the first recorded uh, records of interactions between the Han people and what were then called the Yue people, south of the Yangtze, all the way down into, you know, modern day Vietnam, Laos, uh, and the hill areas uh, in Indochina. Um, those were the first recorded histories. There are so many yeah, people, the Chinese call, call them the Bai Ye, yeah, the hundred, hundred years. Um, so it starts there. Then it goes through the long period of the Nanhai uh, trade, the Nanyang Southern Ocean trade and tribute system um, that China had with, the, with mar mainly maritime Southeast Asia. Um, then it goes, it also discusses the... Um, difficult, if you want to put that way, a relationship that Vietnam has long had uh, with China, including being occupied by and subjugated by China for a century. Um, then in the 20th century, I, I discuss how Southeast Asia was a base for Sun Yat-sen personally and the Republican revolutionaries to plot the overthrow of the Qing dynasty. Um, uh, which occurred in 1911. Uh, then I go a little bit through China's relations with the region between the wars. And then finally, after the People's Republic of China is established in 1949, I talk about the, um, the two dimensions that China had with the region. One dimension is the engagement of um, the bond uh, attendance of and participation in the Bandung Conference and China's endorsement of the non-aligned movement and, and the Afro-Asian movement. That was sort of one th early thrust of Chinese diplomacy in the 1950s. A positive, cooperative thrust, you might say. Then the other thrust in the 60s and the 70s was not so cooperative. It was very subversive. China supported communist uh, party and um, in, insurrection, insurgency movements in every single Southeast Asian country to try and take power and overthrow the existing state. So there, there's a lot of history um, in the book. I just want to forewarn potential buyers and readers if you're looking for a contemporary you know, snapshot of the last few years or today, yes, it's there too, but um, there's a lot of history uh, in it. Um, and then lastly, last kind of preliminary disclaimer is that this book proceeds from the premise um, that the United States and China are now locked into an indefinite comprehensive competition across all functional domains. Um, and I believe this, in, not just in Southeast Asia, but all functional domains and all regions of the world. The U.S.-China competition has gone global. When I wrote my previous book, China Goes Global, it was really just beginning. That was seven years ago. Now it is everywhere. 
all all regions of the world and it's across all spheres diplomacy commerce security ideology values technology public diplomacy soft power so-called influence operations um global governance and other other domains so so that's the sort of independent variable that's the framing paradigm uh for the book and you could you could do this i would argue with any region of the world but southeast asia offers a really interesting sort of microcosm of these different dimensions, functional dimensions across 10 countries in a very important uh, region. And I think it might be kind of a harbinger. The way the competition is playing out in Southeast Asia may uh, offer us some insights into how it might play out in other parts of the world. So it's a microcosm. And I think it's, I find it's going to be increasingly difficult for the 10 ASEAN states to navigate this increasingly intensifying great power competition. They may not like it, um, but they have to live with it. They have a long, now mind you, Southeast Asian states, great power competition is nothing new. Um, they have a history of it, uh, including imperial and colonial uh, great power intervention. And they've become very practiced. Uh, it's almost in the DNA of Southeast Asians to hedge uh, and maneuver and not get too close or locked into a dependent relationship with any external power. Um, that's particularly been the case since the uh, end of the uh, American war in Vietnam. So this sort of post-colonial neutralist identity um, is really important to understand uh, about the region and American diplomacy or, or I would argue China's diplomacy or anybody else's diplomacy in the region uh, had better start there because if you don't understand the deep um, sense of autonomy and neutralism, um, you're not going to get very far. So th that's some of the context and background. Now, what are the big findings of the book, the big takeaways uh, from the book? Well, first, um, I would argue that Southeast Asia is um, not just a theater of major power contestation and interaction. It's very important in its own right. It's in, intrinsically uh, own right. It is no economic or, or geostrategic backwater at all. The stakes are very high there. This is a very dynamic, sprawling region, 3,000 miles from east to west, 2,000 miles from north to south, <clears throat> wedged between other important parts of the region, obviously South Asia, Australasia to the southeast, and East Asia, or what we sometimes call Northeast Asia. Uh, it's a region that has 636 million uh, people, one of the most heavily and densely uh, populated regions uh, on the planet. And its demographic size is matched by extraordinary, as I say, cultural and religious and ethnic diversity um, in all dimensions. And strategically, if you just look at a map, uh, the uh, Southeast Asia is of vital strategic importance because of the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea, through which pass about 50,000 vessels a year, 40% um, of the world's merchandise trade and 25% of the world's energy pass through those uh, through the isthmus uh, to the west of Malaysia, down through Singapore and up through the South China Sea. So geoeconomically, you might say, and hence geostrategically, this is a vitally important region. And economically, ASEAN itself is important. It's if you collectively, it is the fourth largest economy uh, in the world, or sorry, sixth largest economy in the world today, with an aggregate nominal GDP of three trillion dollars. So that's the first point. It's not just a kind of uh, theater for great, great power interaction. Um, it ha it's and it should be seen, I think, on its own merits. Second uh, takeaway, I argue in the book, is that the U.S.-China rivalry in competition is what I, I call a soft rivalry, um, not a hard rivalry. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, a hard rivalry to me is a Cold War style action, reaction, tit for tat um, kind of dynamic as the United States and the Soviet Union had during the Cold War. You know, Washington did a Moscow would do B to counter Washington and then Washington would do C to counter Moscow and so on. This it was a very reactive kind of dynamic during the Cold War. I don't find that yet 
in Southeast Asia. Um, rather, I find a kind of soft, almost like shadow boxing, um, maneuvering uh, between these two major powers. They're each looking over their shoulder, you might say, at the other, paying very close attention to what the other is doing. But they're pursuing their own independent um, policies <clears throat> and programs that are not keyed to countering the other yet. So there's a fluidity to it. And I, I just say, therefore, that there's potential <clears throat> for competitive coexistence. This is not a polarized uh, kind of competition. Uh, it can go there. Um, that's one possibility. I'll talk about that in a second when I get to the conclusion. Um, but um, it's a different type of uh, rivalry than the old Cold War. And I think it's the, you might see that in other regions of the world in the Middle East, in Latin America, uh, in Europe, um, and elsewhere. So, so that's, a, that's a takeaway. A third takeaway is that the US and China are not the only uh, external actors in this drama. Um, regional so-called middle powers, uh, notably Japan, India, Australia, even the European Union, uh, may surprise viewers to learn that the largest investor in Southeast Asia is the EU. Um, and the European Union and individual member states of the EU are also important cultural and educational uh, actors in the region, not security, not military, uh, and not really particularly diplomatic. But the EU is an actor. Um, even South Korea has now I was in the audience in Singapore, in fact, two years ago when President Moon unveiled his new southward policy. And Russia, yeah, you know, in terms of arms sales, at least, Russia is an actor. So this is a multi-actor chessboard. And it's not just the, the two elephants, the U.S. and China. Um, plus, you have the 10 ASEAN member states and ASEAN itself who have their own agency. So this is extraordinary. I had no idea when I started this project how complicated, frankly, it really is very complicated. So many moving parts and actors all simultaneously. So that's a th third conclusion um, is that it's not just a dyadic, you know, big power U.S. Beijing uh, interaction. And then fourthly, the last conclusion I'll flag um, kind of counterintuitive uh, conclusions I came to during the research. Uh, I didn't expect uh, going in. I love projects, by the way, that I don't know the answer to. All my books, I've tried to do something new. I love puzzles and navigating my way through them. And I don't know where I'm going to come out until I get to get out to the other, get them done, come out the other side. Now, in this case, um, I have concluded that China is what I call an overestimated power, and the United States is an underappreciated power. Now, uh, what do I mean by those two bumpers, those two bumper sticker terms? So, if you travel around the region uh, and you read the regional mer uh, media, there is this pervasive, dominant uh, narrative, meme, you might call it, of China's. Um, already being the dominant power in the region. It's, and that, secondly, this is a kind of natural state of affairs. China is rapidly sucking all the societies and the states in the region into their sphere of influence. A new kind of tribute system is occurring and that everybody needs to kind of get on the bandwagon. That is the repetitive narrative that one hears, reads, and encounters throughout the region. But I argue that that is um, not uh, that it's overstated um, and, and that it is empirically incorrect and that there uh, is substantial um, ambivalence, anxiety, and suspicion about China amongst all the Southeast Asian states. They are not getting sucked into a new tribute system. This is not the Ming Dynasty and they don't want to be. Um, they're very ambivalent about China. Geography is a huge factor. So is commerce, but they're very uncomfortable, I argue, or there's, there's an anxiety. There are degrees of comfort and discomfort. And then I also find that China's very uneven power in the region. They have some strengths, obviously economic is their greatest uh, 
strongest tool in their toolbox, but they've got a lot of relative weaknesses, I find. In diplomacy, they get very manipulative of individual states and even the ASEAN secretariat. Um, their soft power, quite weak. Their security assistance programs, minimal. Nowhere near the United States or anybody else. In fact, Russia, I think, has better security assistance in Southeast Asia than does China. Their United Front operations and their uh, penetration of the overseas and, and, and manipulation of the overseas Chinese ethnic communities throughout the region, the diaspora. Those are all weaknesses. And I argue, I found that BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is a mixed story. Um, first of all, it's an incomplete story. We can't come to conclusions yet. The Policy Institute, Danny, you've done a couple of excellent studies on this. Um, so it's too early to say, but I found a lot of evidence of China overreaching, overstepping, um, and alienating uh, other uh, states and societies uh, in Southeast Asia. And I can give you some examples of that when we get into the conversation, if you're interested. But And don't get me wrong, I think Southeast Asian countries generally welcome the BRI on an infrastructure basis, but the Chinese have made a number of mistakes and we've begun to see a lot of pushback in the last few years. And I predict we're gonna have more what I call in the book, Myanmar moments or Malaysia moments. In both of those cases, those countries have pulled back from China and the BRI. And I think that that's a harbinger of what we're gonna see in other places. Um, now, just for the United States, um, uh, I would say that the US gets hardly any uh, attention in the regional media. The US government has a major public diplomacy challenge uh, before it to educate uh, and publicize the role of the US in the region. We have multiple strengths, I would argue. We have weaknesses too, um, but we have multiple strengths. Um, our security assistance programs, including training, arms sales, joint exercises, uh, and other dimensions are second to none, just extraordinary with most countries in the region. Our soft cultural power, um, very strong. Our public diplomacy need of work, but there's some interesting new uh, initiatives. The Wysili Initiative, I just mentioned at the outset, the Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative has trained over 35,000 Southeast Asians under the age of 25. There's a new At America Center in Jakarta, which has become a model for um, such inst institutions elsewhere in the world. American universities, American popular culture, all very appealing still uh, in Southeast Asia. And the American economic presence, not insignificant. We have 4,200, 4,200 American companies operating in the region. We, have, we do $350 billion of trade uh, with the region. And uh, a really unknown story is our FDI, foreign direct investment, is twice as large per year as is China's. In 2018, the U.S. FDI into the region, according to ASEAN statistics, was $25.9 billion. China's $12.9 billion, precisely twice as much on an annual basis. Then if you look at the total stock, there's no comparison. Americans, the stock of F, American FDI in the region, uh, $359 billion, or sorry, $329 billion is greater than China, Japan, and Southeast Asia, South Korea combined. So the American commercial you know, footprint is large. We are never thinking of violet economically in the region. Now we can come back to that. But anyway, I found in researching this book and going around the region that empirically um, China's overrated and the Americans are underrated or underappreciated. And if you look kind of category by category, and I do that in the book very systematically, go through all these different categories, the United States um, uh, has a strong uh, presence and potential to build on. Now, just to conclude, we can get to our conversation. Um, looking to the future, I posit four possible scenarios. First, further bandwagoning with China. Uh, actually, maybe you could put the slide up now. Um, I have one, one slide for people there. That's a snapshot, kind of net assessment snapshot of how I see the region today, 2020. 
um, along a spectrum between the U.S. on the left and, and China on the right. Um, so first thing to say about this is that this is a 2020 net assessment. Two years ago, I wouldn't have necessarily put all the countries in the same order. And two years from now, one year from now, whatever, uh, it's going to continue to evolve as well. So this is a very dynamic, not static situation, how these countries position themselves between the U.S. and China. They move back and forth along the spectrum. Right now, you see seven of the 10 on the um, Chinese side of the so-called neutral line. Three of the 10, Vietnam, Singapore, Philippines, still on the American side. Um, but that's uh, that can change. Um, and we can go into any of those countries in our discussion that you want to. Uh, you know, I can tell you why I put them where I put them, what I Thailand or Indonesia or the Philippines, whatever. So th so um, there could be continued continuation of this slide of, of the bandwagoning effect. Secondly, there could be a uh, continued soft rivalry and competitive coexistence where there's movement back and forth, but no major changes along the spectrum. Third possibility is that there would be greater uh, hard rivalry and polarization where countries are sort of asked <laughs> to choose. Now, this is Southeast Asians nightmare, and many of them, notably Singapore and Prime Minister Li Xian Lung, makes speeches, but others do too, don't ask us to choose. Um, that would be a major mistake in American diplomacy. Now, I, I would argue the Chinese actually are asking region, uh, countries in the region to choose. And that's not going to behoove them. It's one of many weaknesses I see China having. But, and then the fourth possibility looking to the future is kind of more neutralist hedging, whereby Southeast Asians become increasingly, as I say, alienated from uh, and and by China and China's overreach and overstepping. And they begin to pull back from China. I don't foresee a bandwagoning with the United States. Those days are over. But there would be movement to the left-hand end of the spectrum. So those are four possibilities. Um, looking out to the future, I would anticipate um, probably the latter, uh, more neutralist hedging and pulling away from China. So what does that mean? Uh, last point, you can take the slide down. What's that mean for the, for the United States and the incoming Biden administration? Well, um, under these circumstances, my advice would be to just stay steady, be present, invest in all the tools of power, diplomacy, soft power, public diplomacy, military, commerce, educational exchanges, uh, um, and business, uh, in the region um, and show up. Um, you know, this is a truism about the region. Uh, they always <laughs> really complain, quite rightfully, the Americans don't show up. Well, we have to show up. And it begins with putting ambassadors into um, our embassies, uh, which we have not done over the last four years in all of them. So we need to, we, the United States, I think, need to offer Southeast Asia an option not don't ask them to choose, just give them an option to China. And because as I see it, uh, China is becoming too omnipresent, too overbearing, too proximate, too manipulative, and too interventionist. And that is a trend. I don't see the Chinese changing and correcting because they don't really have, they don't have their ear to the ground. They don't really see themselves the way Southeast Asians see them. And you can apply that to anywhere else in the world, by the way. Um, they don't take criticism at all. <laughs> and they just continue on their kind of autopilot in their little propaganda bubble and echo chamber. And they continue to bulldoze other people. Well, that's going to produce um, reactions by the other parties. So why don't I just end there uh, that's a sort of snapshot of the of the book and its arguments and kind of where I see the region going. But we can we can get into any, any of those or, or other topics subsequently. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. It's a testament to the book that I have about a hundred different uh, lines of questioning that I'd love to pursue, and of course I have to be selective. Uh, I also have to remind all of our listeners that you are welcome to submit your questions through YouTube, through Facebook, 
Uh, and David, if you mentioned that you hadn't been to Laos. Laos is one of my favorite countries in the whole world. Uh, one, wait till you get there. Uh, people are amazing. Food is amazing. Luang Prabang, the geography, the history. Laos is, is really cool. Anyway, there's um, it, you in passing touched on the kind of imperial tributary model, both in terms of history of China's relations in, and, and its behavior in Southeast Asia. And, and as you point out, um, your book uh, adds a lot of perspective from uh, the historical point of view. Um, you describe the imperial tributary model as you know, in which peripheral states were expected to show deference uh, to Beijing, among other things. You, you said today that um, they don't want to be sucked into a tributary model, um, and I agree. And they probably didn't want a tributary model in the Ming Dynasty either. Um, but so my question, something I really wondered is, how apt is that analogy, or how off is the tributary model analogy to today's uh, relationship between China and the nations of Southeast Asia in terms of uh, what China under the CCP seems to aim at in terms of promoting economic dependence uh, and using that to get uh, correct thinking, to get political accommodation in, in the region? Great question, Danny. Good one to start the conversation with. Um, you know, no historical analogy um, is identical and replicable, you know, from one century to another. Um, but in this case, um, I think there's a lot of similarity on the way the Chinese are um, behaving and what they're asking of Southeast Asians. Um, now, as you quite correctly just mentioned, the, the tributary system operated on a couple of things. Um, First of all, it was essentially, and I tell my students this, it was a kind of soft power set of relations. It wasn't a hard power, uh, coercive set of relations, with the exception of Vietnam, which China invaded multiple times, occupied for a century. Um, but they didn't use military coercion um, to dominate the region. This was um, done through deferent, through to trade, okay, with maritime Southeast Asia, uh, primarily, um, the non-high trade that Wang Gungwu, to whom the book is dedicated, by the way, has written uh, so much. Um, so there was a kind of swap, you might say, for trade for deference, cultural deference. And we all know about the Chinese sense of, of, of centrality and superiority. And so if the Southeast Asians would provide, and indeed Koreans, uh, would provide deference to China um, and give China a kind of, in today's terminology, kind of de facto veto power over the region. It was that it was a kind of soft hegemony, okay? And then then they were rewarded with commerce. And if you go through museums in Southeast Asia, they're filled with blue and white Chinese porcelains from Jing to Jun, you know, and other. Um, artifacts. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of trade and even today what we might call extended deterrence the Chinese would um, offer. So that's what I think they're looking for today. It's a soft hegemony. They want deference and they've already won. And I have a number of quotes in the book from Southeast Asian diplomats. They've already won the veto power. Southeast Asians will not criticize China publicly. You know this as a diplomat. <laughs> and um, they, the Chinese have neutered uh, Southeast Asian responses um, and co-opted, co you might say, um, or preempted, better word, preempted uh, pushback. Now, Southeast Asians are not happy with a number of things the Chinese are doing, including the South China Sea, uh, Nine Dash Line and the building of islands. And there's six countries that contest, Southeast Asian countries contest those islands with China. Um, the BRI, a lot of the things I just spoke of. So there's a lot of anxiety in Southeast Asia, a lot of hand-wringing. China does things and there's a lot of mumbling and hand-wringing uh, and, and uh, complaining, but they will not go public. So China's already achieved a kind of discourse 
veto power, I would argue. And they have got the ASEAN countries. There have been a couple of cases, as you know, in Cambodia and the in Manila, where ASEAN was unable to come up with a communique at the end of their annual meetings because the Chinese, because the communique wanted to express concern or some very soft language about the South China Sea. Well, Beijing wouldn't take it. And so Beijing uh, used its proxies, namely Cambodia, ASEAN operates in complete consensus. You need all 10 to agree to something. And the Chinese there, as in Europe and in other parts of the world, are very good at um, divide and rule. And so they used uh, Cambodia uh, in, to stop those resolutions. So anyway, you know, I don't think the analogy of the tributary system is, is identical, but I do, frankly, I think it's apt. And if you go back and you read Howard French's book, uh, All Under Heaven, for example, or uh, many other books, and then you go around the region today and you see what the Chinese are doing, trying to co-opt elites, trying to produce economic dependency, not interdependency, dependency on China, um, and threats. The one thing that's different this time around is they're using coercive threats and now military presence um, that they didn't really have other than the Zheng He voyages <laughs> back in the Ming Dynasty. So, so you know, it's not identical, but um, it's a, I think it's a fairly apt analogy. But the Southeast Asians didn't like it then, and they really don't like it now. And they're not, they therefore want alternatives. They want India, they want Japan, they want South Korea, and above all, they want the United States uh, and Australia and these other medium powers to be engaged so the Chinese cannot dominate the region. Well, I uh, appreciate that answer because it's something that I've been uh, wondering and wrestling with. Uh, and as you say, uh, the Southeast Asians want the United States as a balancer. They want uh, many of the things the U.S. has to offer. I saw recently my old friend Hu Yafei uh, speaking in Singapore deliver a warning that if, if uh, they thought they, the Southeast Asians, thought that they could have the economic benefits of from China and uh, security benefits from the United States. That was incorrect thinking. Mm. Um, but on the on the subject, David, of the United States, uh, you know, one of your main findings in the book, uh, and you laid this out just now, is that mm. the U.S. is an underappreciated power in the region. Notwithstanding the fact that the Southeast Asians have, a, there's a demand signal from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and notwithstanding the fact that in many respects, the U.S. has a much more, a much larger, a much more uh, impactful presence and footprint uh, than China does. You've categorized some of the competitive advantages from the U.S. Okay. So why is that? What accounts for that? underappreciated status. Uh, you know, it, it's not just that the Americans need to do better in tomorrow Xi Jinping's term, discourse power, you know, telling our story, right? Southeast Asians are definitely not stupid, as I'm sure, as I know you found. Americans uh, are famous for a lot of things, but not for being humble and shy, particularly. So why is it that the whole is smaller than the sum of the parts when it comes to America's stature in Southeast Asia? Great question that I wrestled with throughout the book and still do. Uh, I'm not sure I have a, a sound answer for you, Danny. Um, one diplomat, a uh, senior experienced Southeast Asian diplomat who you know, I asked this question of because I wrestled with this throughout all my travels in the region. And he said, look, David, uh, it's because you're taken, you Americans, are taken for granted. You've been here. This commercial presence, the security assistance programs are sending our students to your universities, um, your businesses. Uh, that's been around. China's the new story. This person and many others actually made this point, too. China's arrived really on the scene in Southeast Asia, you know, in the current era only in the last 15 years or so become active in these various areas. The United States has been there ever since the end of the American Vietnam War, um, if not before. So there's a, you know, that's what he, this diplomat told me, and it 
you know, it's kind of interesting if you take something for granted, it's like Joseph Nye's argument about uh, soft powers like oxygen. You, until you don't have it, you don't know it. Um, but I think it's also just an information issue. And some of these countries, governments are uh, very uncomfortable um, publicizing uh, their relations with the United States, particularly their security relations. Uh, and regional media uh, don't know a lot about the U.S. Um, or the American role in the region. And a lot of the regional media are increasingly owned by China or shell companies controlled by China. But, take, you know, there's the Islamic factor as well. And this predates Trump and his Islamophobic, you know, exclusionist immigration policies. I was there doing research for this book during that period. Um, but Malaysia and Indonesia, we have extensive security ties with the militaries in those two countries. You wouldn't know it. Neither the Indonesian or the Malaysian government wishes to say anything publicly. In fact, they go out of their way to keep the media in those two countries from reporting on, on the issue. Well, that's okay. It's better to, we don't have, a, you know, insecurity Rodney Dangerfield complex where we need to be patted on our back for doing these security assistance programs. Um, I'm just saying that they're not known about. So it's a combination of media. I think it's a failure of American public diplomacy. Unfortunately, I really believe in public diplomacy. I know I have a number of colleagues, uh, public diplomacy officers I've met in all the embassies, very hardworking, well-intended foreign service officers, but they're just not getting the message out about the U.S. And they're not countering Chinese narratives either. The U.S.-China competition, I believe, globally, not just Southeast Asia, will be determined by a lot of things, but it's going to be, in my mind, won or lost in the information space, discourse. And the Chinese in Southeast Asia have, have hegemonic position. They dominate the discourse. And the United States is very underappreciated. The U.S. has got to kind of get into the information space. <clears throat> there are different ways to do it, but um, if you look empirically, I just found in my research, I was really surprised at, at the breadth and depth of the American position in the region and actually the shallowness and the narrowness of the Chinese position. It was very counterintuitive. I, di I didn't expect to find that. Well, David, if uh, America is being taken for granted uh, historically in modern Southeast Asia, then we may have a large debt of gratitude uh, to Donald J. Trump uh, on that score, uh, because they certainly couldn't take us for granted by the end of the Trump administration. And if uh, China is dominating the discourse space, then uh, maybe we also have a debt of gratitude to the wolf warriors who are rapidly chewing up uh, China's uh, soft power and its uh, reputation. But uh, on that uh, related note, um, We've got a great question in from Facebook uh, that I sort of paraphrase is in this way, namely um, subsequent to your travels in the region uh, and as you were sort of mulling over and writing the book uh, and more recently, there have been some pretty dramatic uh, developments. One of them is the advent of COVID-19 and that includes the after a grotesquely problematic start, the uh, ultimate uh, brutal efficiency of the Chinese system in controlling the virus and, in a sharp counterpoint to American fecklessness. Um, another is the successful conclusion of the RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, Trade Agreement. There's some other things. Does, do these developments over the past nine months or six months uh, change any of your conclusions or, or reinforce them? Um, good questions. I don't think COVID um, and the responses to COVID have changed uh, my conclusions. Um, uh, RCEP, um, you know, is more evidence of bandwagoning, you might say, or of increasing uh, interconnectivity economically, of course, um, between China and the and the region and the other members of RCEP. RCEP, as I understand it, and I'm not an economist and I don't haven't looked at it very carefully, 
is a giant FTA. Now, China already has an FTA with ASEAN. It came into force in 2010 and has been very facilitative of trade uh, between, in fact, the first quarter of this year, um, ASEAN has become China's leading trading partner, having overtaken the European Union, uh, almost $600 billion on a year to year basis. Um, so I, I would kind of read RCEP as another accelerator of that trend. Um, but I don't really see any major changes in the last six months uh, from the Chinese, or, well, from from the Chinese side or from events in the region to change my fundamental conclusions. Now, the Trump administration, as elsewhere in the world, and you just pointed out, uh, the American reputation, if it wasn't good before he came to office, and it was good. I, I started. We started off our conversation. I sincerely mean that. The uh, and many S Southeast Asians told me this wherever I went. The Obama administration was the exception to the rule, the high point of U.S. Southeast Asian relations. And it was just, I wouldn't say completely squandered. The Trump administration reverted to the episodic attention uh, that it had, we'd previously had. So it was a reversion to the mean. Obama, and when you were in charge, <laughs> was the exception to the rule. So Trump, and then you had the the exclude the Islamophobia, and that went down extremely badly in the region, particularly obviously in Malaysia and Indonesia, but elsewhere as well. Withdrawal from TPP. I was living out there uh, when the day that Trump announced that you could just feel and hear the oxygen being sucked out of the region after eight years of negotiations over TPP, of which a number, not all, but a number of ASEAN states were members. Um, and then our own really self-inflicted wounds here at home, the dysfunctionality of our democracy, the uh, systemic racism um, that predated the summer demonstrations, the inequities. So if you look at the polling that the association, or not the association, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore does every January, their state of Southeast Asia survey, very interesting data on a number of fronts, it just showed a precipitous decline of the American reputation in the region during the Trump four years. Um, but they have some very you know, well-crafted questions they ask. It also shows a, a residual strength I can quickly be reactivated, I would argue. And if the Biden administration pays attention to the region and plays his hand right and invests in public diplomacy and gets out there and does a number of things that uh, the Obama administration had done, uh, that can be uh, catalyzed and, and, and reactivated, um, I would say. But uh, the U.S. Um, reputation, <laughs> not just a Southeast Asia problem. And, you know, it's going to just as in Europe across the Atlantic, it's going to take some time to rebuild trust, to heal, to kind of establish the United States as a predictable actor and partner, not to mention ally. Again, this is not going to happen on January 21st in Southeast Asia or, or elsewhere. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Um, but even Kishore Mabubani, who's a noted critic of the United States, in his most recent, and a former Singaporean diplomat, very well-known public intellectual, his most recent book on U.S.-China competition, he even he says that there is a reservoir, a deep reservoir of goodwill and respect for the United States in Southeast Asia, if only the Americans would tap into it and do certain things. So, you know, I, I think that the U.S. position weakened, yes, but uh, the foundation or the intrinsic strengths are, are there. They just need to be uh, built upon. And I, as I've been arguing, the Chinese are their own worst enemies. In fact, you can argue the greatest strength for the United States in the U.S.-China competition in Southeast Asia and elsewhere is, is where? It's China itself. Wolf warrior diplomacy, overbearingness, debt diplomacy, lots of actions the Chinese are taking, coercive actions, economic punitive actions, and military buildup, all this stuff is just going to hurt them. So um, the U.S. just has to be there, be present, offer an option. 
David, thank you. You've uh, given us a lot. You've described uh, China and the U.S. Uh, as locked in this full-spectrum contest for primacy across uh, multiple domains and uh, helped us understand why Southeast Asia is, uh, is a microcosm um, of that uh, dynamic. I will say that if Southeast Asia is a microcosm, your um, spectrum of alignment isn't very <laughs> encouraging. You've only got three of the 10 countries on the U.S. side of the line, and, and that includes uh, uh, an ally whose president, uh, through his behavior, has kind of reminded you of that if with friends like this, who needs enemy uh, phrase. But um, in addition to the value of the history and the analysis that you set out in, in the book, I think you've really given us a lot to watch and a lot to think uh, about in terms of the development of the of geopolitics and geoeconomics in, in the ASEAN region, uh, further bandwagoning with China, soft rivalry, hard rivalry with sharp China, U.S. China polarization, or as clearly your, your instincts point, uh, more neutrality and, and hedging. So this book, Where Great Powers Meet, uh, has set out uh, the issues and, and posed the questions. We better stay tuned for your next book, David, to get more of the answers. We're out of time. I want to thank you uh, very much, and uh, we look forward to more um, productivity from the great book writing machine uh, and great professor and great scholar, David Shambaugh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. <laughs>